Welcome to Little Break's virtual book tour. Today we are talking to Eric Cervini, author of The Deviant's War, The Homosexual Versus the United States of America. Eric, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Can you tell us what this book is about or who it's about? Well, the spine of the book, as in his, his photograph is actually on the spine, and I use him as kind of the, the through line to tell a larger story of America and gay rights in the 1960s, uh, was Frank Kameny. And as we were just talking about, he was an astronomer uh, at the height of the space race. And a lot of people have heard of Senator McCarthy going after alleged communists uh, during the 50s. What a lot of people don't realize is that at an even higher rate, the government was going after alleged uh, sexual deviants or homosexuals at the exact same time, and in fact, at an even higher rate. So Frank Kameny was one of those victims. He lost his job, even though he had spent 15 years training to be an astronomer, had always wanted to go to space. Uh, and what made him so different was he was the first to fight back. Uh, he was the first to take uh, as a gay rights case to the Supreme Court in 1961, uh, to march outside of the White House in 1965, and eventually drawing from the Black Freedom Movement, uh, he translated uh, Black is Beautiful became Gay is Good. And he was really responsible for initiating a lot of the, the groundwork for what we now celebrate each June as Pride. And this was all before Stonewall. For sure. It was so interesting and so inspiring to learn about this important part of American history. I cried in your closing chapter, I'm not afraid to say. It's, it's such a great balance of history and personal uh, aspects of his life also. I'm going to steal this first question from your Deviant's World Instagram series, which I love, um, and just ask, you know, what your origin story is with history and with social justice. Um, I know that you dedicate the book to your mom, Lynn, uh -huh. who brought you to anti-war marches and AIDS memorial services and conferences yeah. and legalization of gay marriage when you were a kid. So she must have had a huge impact on this. Origin. Yeah, you're going to make me cry. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about anytime Thanks, I think mom. about my, my – and I'm always touched when people actually read the acknowledgments because I always thought – um, as kind of a book nerd that I was the only one who actually read the acknowledgments, but I've realized so many people have read them. Um, so I'm grateful for that. Um, but yeah, my mom was single mother raising me in, in central Texas. And I was very lucky, unlike so many people growing up in, in Texas and across the South and across the world. Um, she was so incredibly supportive, um, not just of me, but of social justice in general. Uh, and I was also lucky to have been part of a church that was very progressive. And I think that's something that surprised me in my research and surprises a lot of people in the book that, you know, as much harm as the religious community has done to the queer community, they've also done a lot of good. And you know, some of the first allies that you see, Frank Kamney, Barbara Giddings, all these early activists, um, teaming up with were, were churches. And I was lucky to, you know, those, those AIDS memorials I went to as part of my, my church. So I was lucky to see a version of faith and spirituality that mm. wasn't exclusionary and that was actually really committed to, to radical justice and being really progressive. Um, and my mom was the one who really facilitated all of that. So she's, uh, She's still hard at work fighting. She just, a year ago, she w went to um, jail as part of a, 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 a sit-in at a congressman's office um, protecting asylum seekers. So Go mom. She's, still, she's still going <laughs> at it at the age of 70. So it goes to show it's never too late to start um, acting up. It's so cool. I loved, yeah, your book is so awesome. I'm so glad that she was Thank in you. the acknowledgments. Um, the book starts off with the facts of, you know, what the public restroom or tea room was uh, at the time, a place where gay men could interact, but it was also used to criminalize their homosexual behavior. Um, in 1957, Frank's act in a tea room resulted in him being fired, as you said, as an astronomer for the U.S. Department of Defense. I really liked how much you humanized him in the book because he, he has this frustration with balancing being gay and balancing being employed. And mm -hmm. he, after that event, 
he wavers between how open and distant he is um, from his, you know, being open about his sexuality. Can you talk about the importance of humanizing a hero and the kind of the balancing the personal aspects of his life and, and history? Yeah, I, I really like that term that you use, humanizing, because I think so often, especially in, in queer history, um, especially works, articles, books coming out of, out of academia, they're, they're often stripped of the humanity. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to work hard to do that, because when you actually do the research and you're reading these people's letters, mm -hmm. you know, they're not talking like you read in, a, in an academic article, they're talking like normal human beings. They're writing out their feelings and their emotions. And those same feelings and emotions are often spurring their ideologies or their, you know, their, their tactics within a movement. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's important to show how complex a movement and all the different personalities within it really are. And also to show the flaws, right? Like humans are inherently flawed. And that's why I actually really like the term uh, up for Frank as being the grandfather of the gay rights movement, because a grandfather, like my, when I think of my own grandfather, I think of someone who, who yes, is responsible for my birth mm -hmm. and my creation, and I wouldn't be here without him. But also like grandpa was kind of racist, mm -hmm. he was, like not, he was really behind the times. He like wasn't really adapting with, you know, my generation, with how America was progressing. And I think that's a very, very similar phenomenon that you see with Frank because yes, he was responsible for developing one of the first iterations of Pride, but at the end of the day, he wasn't able to adapt. And he also really messed up, leaving a lot of people out of the movement. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we have to learn from those failures to make sure we're not forgetting people today. For sure. It was so interesting to learn about um, him frequenting the white gay bars instead of mm -hmm. black gay bars and how certain white gay bars in Washington weren't targeted as much. All these fascinating points of history. Um, what, what was your favorite part of his life to research and what was the most challenging to track down? My favorite part, I think, was finding the tidbits of humanity mm -hmm. in there because he was a very, I mean, you can see it in, in, in the book, he was a very methodical, logic-based, almost like a robot, right? Mm -hmm. he, he knew what he believed to be right and it was his way or the highway and if it wasn't logical, then it wasn't correct. And he didn't leave that much room in his life for romance mm -hmm. or, or, you know, uh, friendship, but he did have friends and he did have romances, even if they were rare or maybe there were few of those friends and being able to find tidbits of that was actually really, really incredible. But it was also, I would say the hardest part, right? Because he didn't talk about it. He didn't talk about that first tea room arrest. He didn't talk about, you know, getting arrested another time in, in a, uh, a bathhouse in, in Baltimore or, you know, his other flings that he had until much later in his life or sometimes just as asides and letters. So it was hard to find those, those bits of humanity. But when I did find them, it was just incredibly thrilling. Yeah, reading your book made me realize how few those moments are in the telling of these you know, heroes, you know, it, it just made me realize that it's, we kind of leave out so much of their m messy or personal right. life. And um, also the whole section of his, you know, his main relationship and their kind mm -hmm. of being around Tucson and being yeah. around the astronomy in Tucson. I'm from Tucson. Oh, cool. So I was like, oh, this is cool. I know yeah. where they are right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> did you, you went to Harvard also. And so did he. I didn't send you this, but did you find any connection there and learning about his experience and yours? While I was there? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the most I could find of his time there, there were two things. First was uh, during the Korean War, mm -hmm. he was actually very active. This was before he was even out to the world. Uh, he, he was arguing against the Korean War and against the draft. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, he had articles in the student newspaper that were mm -hmm. actually really heavily criticized by other students. I ended up having to cut uh, that part from the book because I just didn't have the space for it. Mm -hmm. But that was a really interesting remnant of this time. You can go on the Harvard uh, Crimson website and find 
you know, uh, articles written by him, which is really cool. And then second, um, his, his dissertation is still in the Harvard Library. So okay. if you go into the Harvard Library database, you can type in Frank Kameny and almost nothing will come up. Maybe my book will come up now, but before that, almost nothing would come up about him except the dissertation he wrote on, you know, these uh, interstellar events and <laughs> very, very scientific things that have nothing to do with gay rights. And it wow. just reminds you that that was his real passion. You know, mm -hmm. his real passion throughout his entire life was space and he never got the chance to actually engage in it. Mm -hmm. When he received that apology from the U.S. government at the end, I was weeping. But anyways, uh, <laughs> can you talk about the importance of, even though he did leave a lot of people out of his movement, can you talk about the importance of knowing his history? Because it does connect gay rights to the Black Freedom Movement and trans mm -hmm. resistance also. Right. Yeah, I describe him not just as a grandfather, but also as his Xerox machine. I think that's the other really helpful uh, analogy because I think what made him so effective mm -hmm. was he looked around him during the 1960s. He wasn't just one guy acting in a vacuum. He, he saw what was happening in the successes of the Black Freedom Movement. You know, he was at the 1963 March on Washington, which was organized by a Black gay man, Bayard Rustin. And he saw the effects that it had, not just as on him as, as an attendee, but also politically on the entire nation and on the president uh, and on Congress and saw the, the tangible legislative successes of the next year and said, wait a second, maybe homosexuals should be doing the exact same thing. And so that's why you know he was the first to protest outside of the White House because mm -hmm. he thought this could actually cause change. And when that didn't work, he saw people like Stokely Carmichael um, declaring black power and also black is beautiful. And he said, wait a second, this is the same feeling of inferiority that we need to combat as, as homosexuals. And so he devises before anyone else, gay is good. And this is a year before Stonewall. So even though the movement was so small, once you had this explosion in activism after Stonewall, they looked to a, an, an ideology that already existed. And we can thank him for that. So cool. I want like a billion t-shirts with that. Somebody's made this, right? Gay is good. Somebody. I would hope so. Do you have a button yet? I don't. I'll I send do. you I'll send you a button. Please, <laughs> please do. We need yeah, of this. Course. We need this. Um, yeah. I really liked the section about uh, you know, he was the first openly gay candidate for United States Congress in 1971. Um, and that campaign was so interesting. You, you write about how he spent a lot of time campaigning for straight voters um, mm -hmm. in a perfectly straight campaign. Um, but it was also a display of gay economic power and really a turning point in Washington's political structure. I, I really liked hearing that, you know, gay Washington voters were hesitant to vote for him right. because they wanted somebody that stood a chance or were fearful that people would find out who they were voting for. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of a big question, but what do you think we can learn from that campaign when we're trying to engage with gay voters today? It's a great question because I think, and you saw it with his campaign mm -hmm. when you know he, he didn't allow drag queens, for example, into mm -hmm. his, into his uh, uh, or there was a talk of not allowing drag queens into his campaign events. And also he didn't make that much of an, outreach effort to, to black voters or to black gay residents. And I think, you know, now as we now have marriage, right, we now have, supposedly we have anti-discrimination <laughs> uh, employment protections. Now we have to say, well, now that we have this, who have we forgotten, right? And I think looking at, you know, who have we forgotten in the past and making sure that future campaigns and future activism is putting them up front, especially mm -hmm you know, the, the status and the violence faced by Black trans women in particular, who are 16 times more likely to get murdered than, than someone who looks like me. And so that's where we need to be going, I think, as a movement and, and recognizing the mistakes that we've made in the past. For sure. It was, was kind of, you know, I'm sure the scarcity around information about him was, you know, part of the reason that inspired you to write the book. But was it also that he was imperfect? Was that part of it too? I think so. And I started the book not wanting it to be just about him. And I ended it also not wanting it to be about him. 
because I wanted to tell a story of this one organization, right. the Managing Society of Washington. And what you realize when you're, when you're researching it, and of course through the book, is often they were synonymous, but they didn't have to be, and maybe they shouldn't have been. Um, and I think people around him recognize that, that you know, when he let his own ego get in front of him, um, he was also letting down his organization and his community and his minority. And mm -hmm. so I think now, as you're seeing this huge upsurge in, in activism, we have to make sure that we're always putting the cause first, right? Mm -hmm. And we're always, you know, like I said, asking who are we forgetting, right? And especially in this election, um, there are a lot of people who in this pandemic, yes, it's a big issue, but also, you know, how is the pandemic affecting homeless queer youth? How is it affecting um, people who don't have health care at all or housing? Um, and so I hope that it reminds people that, you know, it's those with the least to lose, the people who are most affected in this current mm -hmm. crisis, who are the first to also fight for us. And historically, that's been proven true. Definitely. I loved your book. I think this kind of, you know, this angle of American history is so important to learn about. Um, and it just, it reminded me, I'm sure there are so many LA organizations with, you know, centered on LGBTQ members of our community that we should be focusing on. Do you know any off the top of your head? Yes, um, there's a, an LA gender project that does great work uh, protecting especially black trans lives. Mm -hmm. um, there are other national organizations um, that are doing great work like uh, the Marsha P. Johnson Institute mm -hmm. and the Sylvia Rivera Law Center, which are phenomenal. Of course, uh, Black Lives Matter has a, a super vibrant chapter here that is still working, still, mm -hmm. still organizing demonstrations, even though you don't see them on the news because you know th th this, this movement is not gonna die away, even if the media stops reporting on it. Um, it's gonna continue, and I think now is a time for people who look like me, like cis, gay white guys who have always been in in the front lines and in, in, in trying to get rights for ourselves now it's time to to really elevate those organizations that have been doing the hard work for those who who people like me have, have forgotten for sure well thank you so much for coming on it was such a pleasure to talk to you here's Likewise. the book the deviant's war everyone should read it and thank you so much i really appreciate it thanks for having me